All right, guys, we're going to get started. <laughs> Welcome to week two of the Chinook Entrepreneur Challenge. So week one is done. Uh, we have our, uh, this week, have quite the uh, week in store for you. We have uh, Paul Lynn from Westland Insurance who's going to talk about uh, insurance and ownership, and he's a really knowledgeable guy in that area, so I really encourage you guys to ask as many questions as you can. Um, and we also have a panel coming as well afterwards where we have a few different business owners. I'm going to introduce them during the panel itself. Uh, but really the point of that is for you guys to talk to entrepreneurs who have successful businesses here in Lethbridge and have been in business for a while. A couple of them have taken part in the CEC before and they're absolutely great resources. So uh, once we go through, you guys are going to be able to ask as many questions as you'd like of them, okay? And that's just a breakdown of what we have uh, in the coming weeks. So the first thing I have is just a little bit of a housekeeping things that I want to talk to you about. We'll go over last week really quick. We're going to have a presentation by Paul. We're going to have a quick break, the panel discussion, and then the conclusion, okay? Uh, so I want to talk real quick about the first session. A lot of information. Was anyone here not able to attend last week by any chance? By show of hands? Were you able to see it on the YouTube video? No, I didn't watch it. That's not fair. Totally fair. A um, lot of information last week. We had uh, Craig Elias from Calgary. What was your guys' opinion on Craig out of curiosity? It's good. Good? <laughs> what was, uh, I, I, I always want to do this kind of and see what your biggest takeaway was from each of the presenters. Just for my own use going forward, especially when we're training for next year or planning for next year. So anybody willing to share what they like the most out of, say, Craig's presentation or MNPs? Yeah. I think that Craig was really natural, you know, like the way he thought you, like you felt that he was, he had lived the experience. Oh, yeah. Uh, in comparison with uh, the other guy, I don't remember his name, but he was like kind of reading and even though he was in, in person, yeah. Craig, alive, Craig made more of a, of a impact. Yeah. You know? And have you guys sat in on a lot of web training before out of curiosity? Yes, no, kind of. Yeah. When I worked at RBC, the thing about banks is they love digital training. They'll have a trainer sit somewhere in Montreal and Vancouver, they'll throw you in a webinar just like they, we did kind of with Craig, and then they just talk to you for two hours. And I can't tell you the number of those that I almost fell asleep in. <laughs> like it's, it's a really difficult thing to do to hold people's attention during a presentation like that. And for him to do that and come in, and, and I mean, not a whole lot, I don't think I heard anybody having their own conversations and things like that. I mean, that is a phenomenal takeaway, definitely. Um, uh, were there any questions about last week, about anything that was covered that you wanted clarity on? We do have an accountant here today as well. Uh, so if you have accounting questions, I won't be totally sidelined. No, perfect. So I wanted to, in terms of housekeeping, oh, did you have a question? Yeah, sir. We didn't really touch uh, limited uh, partners. Partnership. We'll be going more into detail on the different business structures for sure. Um, yeah. I was going to say, I wonder if that fellow's wife had a baby or not. No, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I, no, everything's okay though. And you know, and it's it's funny because I was really nervous because my wife, my wife's about seven and a half months pregnant. Um, so it made me think, just just so you guys know, there might be a session where I just run out uh, and not know what's going on. Uh, that's why, uh, because it's my first kid, so I'm no idea what's going on. Uh, but no, no baby yet, but everything's okay with mom and, uh, and with Reese as well. Um, so in terms of housekeeping, I wanted to go a little bit more in detail about the competition itself and about the prizes that we're giving out this year. Because we had so much to cover last week, there was a lot of information that I couldn't get to that I really wanted to make you guys uh, aware of. And this is something, honestly, this competition, I'm going to drill this into your head because this is so critically important. This top point, this deadline. April 21st is the deadline. And I'd like all of you to pull out a pen and write 2 o'clock p.m. in big, bold letters and underline it. Because I'm going to say it every single week. If we get your business plan after 2 p.m., it will not be considered. Okay? Those are all online submissions. Very similar to how you guys actually registered for the challenge as well. Um, and I'd recommend if you think that there's going to be some issues or if you're a little bit worried about it, do it a week before, do it a few days before, and call me and ask me, hey, do you have my, my business plan? Just because we want to make sure that you guys are submitted there as well. So the screening process is going to, the timeline on that is going to depend a little bit on how many submissions we get. But in terms of how that works, typically the judging itself will let you know that you're a finalist before that June 1st date. And you guys will come in, typically we've done it in the past on June 1st, where you come in and all the finalists, typically we have three for each, um, 
of our streams, and they're going to present to the judges on June 1st. So uh, we'll be in contact with those people who are finalists closer to the date, and if we need to work around things for you, then just let us know, okay? Um, and then there's over $60,000 in cash and in-kind prizes. And a little bit more on the prizes because that's really what everybody's here for, right? I mean, other than the knowledge, the free stuff is really cool too. So there's two streams that I talked about last, last week. We have the general stream and the technology stream, so you're one or the other. So we're gonna have $25,000, or sorry, $15,000 in cold hard cash up for grabs in both of those. We're gonna have a, a grand prize of $10,000 in each of those and then a $5,000 runner up. Uh, the other thing that we're really excited about are the next two on the list, the in-kind marketing. We, because we have so many partners, especially that understand marketing, two in particular are Clear Sky Radio. They own 94.1 and 98.1. And we also have the Leftbridge Herald. And they're the ones that are going to be giving the free in-kind marketing. So it could be a half a page spread in the Leftbridge Herald. It could be a series of radio ads through 94.1, those sort of things. So those, especially for entrepreneurs that don't understand the marketing side of things, which is, I mean, in, in my job, I see a lot of people that struggle with that marketing side. Uh, because it can be really difficult and there's a lot of intangibles in marketing you know there's a lot of buzzwords that they use um, so that can be really great and the free chamber of commerce memberships those can be expensive and the benefit that you get for being a member of the chamber of commerce in Lethbridge is huge not just the resources that you have to rely on but also the events that you get invited to as well um, this year we're doing an innovation award this is one that we're really excited about this year so i talked a little bit about tech connect last week we partnered with Economic Development Lethbridge and Tech Connect. And Tech Connect is an incubator, a technology incubator on the north side of Lethbridge. And what they do is they take technology-based businesses and they help you get to commercialization, okay? So that innovation award, part of that award, they're gonna give you a free year of rental space in their incubator. And that gives you access to their programmers, that gives you access to their specialists, that gives you access to the people that they have that can help you get your business off the ground. And then uh, just again, over sixty thousand dollars in cash, uh, in cash and in kind prizes. So, without too much further ado, I'm actually going to start the presentation. Pass it off. Uh, as I mentioned, Paul has a lot of experience in the in the, in the <coughs> industry and uh, especially with businesses as well. Uh, so, I'm going to invite him up here to talk about uh, about his specialties. Um, and keep in mind, he's a really knowledgeable guy. And questions are key. So, if you guys have questions, uh, just just let him know. Everyone, give uh, Paul a round of applause. Now we just got to figure out how to switch it over. <laughs> That's the thing, right? Okay. <laughs> Had the same issues last. How do we switch over to the next presentation? Uh, while they're getting all set up, I'll just uh, introduce myself. My name is Paul Vanderhoeft. I have been in the insurance industry for whew, 15 or 16 years now. Uh, I am a commercial primarily insurance broker with Westland Insurance. Uh, for those of you that don't know or maybe more familiar, it used to be called Hunt Insurance here in Lethbridge. Um, before that, I was an underwriter with an insurance company in Calgary, uh, Wawanisa, which may be an insurance company that many of you have heard of before, uh, as they are quite popular in this province. Um, in addition to my experience, I'm currently the president of the Lethbridge Insurance Brokers Association. I sit on the board of directors for the Provincial Association of Insurance Brokers and um, currently nominated for vice president of that organization. So uh, a lot of my day from the time I get up to the time I go to bed is pretty much insurance. So it's all I do and so that most people don't have to because uh, it can be tedious. Insurance uh, policy wordings and so forth can be very complex uh, and depending on what it is that you do for uh, your particular business, it can definitely be very involved, it's, but it can also be very simple. Um, it's up here, it's up there, perfect. Just, yeah, click the way, perfect. Um, so, some additional background, I do have a bit, uh, business degree, I have my uh, commerce degree, uh, I'm also a uh, certified insurance professional and a Canadian accredited insurance broker, so I have uh, plenty of insurance education as well as a background in business and so I think that will lend itself to uh, being useful for for you and for for you to pick my brain on uh, primarily insurance as it relates to business but I do have like I said um, my background is actually in marketing so I can uh, address some of that and how that relates to insurance as well 
Um, so the best thing to do, and, and uh, can everybody can everybody see that? Can read that? Pretty straightforward. Can we do that last week? We didn't So basically, I mean, what is insurance? This is a, a, a technical legal definition of what an insurance policy actually is. But in reality, as you read through that, I'll, I'll put it into regular English. It's an insurance policy, which for specified consideration would be the premium that's paid, the money, uh, where one party, the insurance company, will enter into an agreement with you as the policy holder uh, to basically pay for claims arising out of uh, the operation of your business and so depending on the type of business and the portion of the business that you're insuring that can be anything from an automobile accident that you have just like with your personal vehicles to a, a bodily injury claim because somebody slipped and fell in your store or property damage because you know you were you ran the bobcat into the building you know that that type of stuff so um, basically uh, that's insurance in a nutshell for our for the big picture and now it's kind of figuring how your business fits into that and what it needs. Um, so there's some different reasons why you would need insurance. Uh, a lot of, to be honest, a lot of new business owners and even some long-term seasoned veterans that have been out there um, don't fully understand why they need insurance and uh, there's always things that they learn and you will not know it all after this session. Um, you will not probably know it all with respect to insurance after 10 years as far as what you need. As your business grows, expands, evolves, things change and what you will need will change with it. Um, but there are legal requirements. So for instance, automobile insurance, it is the law. You must have automobile insurance to operate a vehicle. Um, there are going to be contractual obligations that you have when you enter into uh, a contract to provide products or services to a client uh, or they enter into uh, an agreement with you to receive some advice or something along those natures, those contracts often contain an insurance section that says you must have this. And, uh, and, they, and they give you a very broad uh, indication of what you need. Sometimes they'll specify exactly what types of limits of insurance that you need and what, uh, and sometimes if they're very technical type contracts, they'll give you exactly what you need and, and you know, two minimums. Um, and then, of course, risk financing. So there's a number of things. One, um, the biggest fear for a business owner should be the fear of getting sued um, for, what, for what you do. Uh, negligence. Those things that um, you shouldn't have done as a reasonable business owner wouldn't have done those, but you did them anyway, and now somebody is suing you because something happened that caused them to suffer some sort of loss whether it be loss to their property, injury to themselves, or some sort of financial loss. And so you want to finance that risk. You want to pay a small premium to an insurance company so that if you get sued for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars uh, based on what you're doing, that small premium and your deductible pays for the insurance company to defend you and pay the judgment so that you can not risk your business uh, having to shutter its doors. Um, additionally, when you're dealing with lending organizations, whether it be a bank or an organization like Community Futures, when you are buying uh, property, equipment, computers, uh, manufacturing equipment, those types of things, often those lenders will ask you to provide insurance on those things so that if something happens, you'll be in the situation where that lender can get its money from the insurance company rather than you have to replace that and then once they have that money from the insurance company, you can set up to refinance buying the replacement equipment. So it perpetuates itself. Um, so most people would be familiar, and I'm only dealing with commercial insurance here, there's all kinds of personal products out there as well. But um, for commercial insurance, I mean, everybody's familiar with the fact, you know, automobile insurance is out there. It's really, um, at the base level, not much different than your personal car. Um, then there's the commercial general liability insurance. This is the insurance that all business owners should have, regardless of what you're doing. This is the um, insurance that protects you as a business owner from bodily injury or property damage that arises out of your negligence to another party. 
right? Like I said before, if somebody comes into your store and slips and falls, trips over the carpet, uh, that type of thing, um, protection for claims for getting sued for being hurt. Um, it is not workers' compensation. That's something different. And that's not something that insurance brokers deal with in Alberta. That is a government uh, program. All business owners should have workers' compensation coverage as well, um, especially as you start to put uh, some employees to work for you. Um, the prop commercial property insurance, that is the insurance on your building, if you own the building, on your contents, your tools, your equipment, uh, and those types of things. The, the the functional pieces of equipment that you need and use every day to actually do your business. Um, and then there's some specialty property insurance policies that are out there that will include some other uh, key things like uh, business income interruption coverage, um, equipment breakdown, and, and a few things and I'll get into that a little bit more. And then specialty liability insurance. So if you're getting into a business where um, you hold some sort of special license, you have some uh, professional training that the average layperson doesn't have, uh, you know, dentist, doctor, lawyer, uh, basically where a lot of your business involves advice giving and, uh, and people put a lot of credence into what you're saying and, and telling them as, you know, this is the right thing to do, this is how to do it, this is why we do it, this is why you should do it. Um, and you follow that advice. Uh, if that is not, um, you know, if it leads to financial disaster for that client, there is always the potential for them to sue. Basically, saying that your advice was not what it was purported to be, and I lost money because I actually listened to you. So, if you're getting into those types of uh, of scenarios, um, that's a very key piece that a general liability policy doesn't cover. Um, okay, so we'll get into, I keep looking there, forgetting that the screen's up there. So, um, automobile insurance, basically in, in business, there are three types of automobile insurance that you need to concern yourself with. There's the, the average business use. So like I said, if you're a consultant, if your primary job is driving around to go and, and estimate jobs um, is to, uh, you know, as, as a realtor or as some other type of advisor, you're going out and you're occasionally taking clients, you know, for lunch and those types of things. You put a lot of miles on the vehicle, but you're not carrying tools and equipment and that type of stuff. You call it business use insurance. It's very similar to personal use. It's only um, slightly different in the sense that instead of just commuting to and from work, you're actually, in some cases, almost living in your vehicle because you've got so much on the go. Um, commercial use. This is going to be your tip. Yes? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you mid sentence. I was just wondering so, business use, mm -hmm. like, how is this different if you have, let's say, a sole proprietorship and you've got your car and mm -hmm. you use it for your business now? Do I need to go get a commercial business use insurance? No, business use coverage, and I think <coughs> that's a good clarifi clarifying question. Business use is kind of a, it's a hybrid between personal use and commercial insurance. So, when you move into pure commercial insurance, that's when you start uh, start to deal with hauling around tools, equipment. You have a commercial trailer on the back and you're hauling, you know, if, for instance, you're a contractor and you're hauling around your skid steer, uh, those types of things where um, the sole purpose of having that vehicle is to conduct your business. Whereas business use is a lot, uh, it's more incidental um, running, doing your, going to see your clients, going to see your banker, going to see, you know, the various meetings that you have with uh, various other professionals that you have to interact with to, to keep your business going forward. So, so if I have my own car currently, mm -hmm. do, do I need to change my insurance then from my like current? What, like, what <coughs> point, I guess, is yeah, when, yeah, you, it, when do you go to? That is, yeah, um, basically the moment that you start using your vehicle for anything other than just pleasure use and commuting to and from a job you should talk to your insurance professional about whether or not you need business business use. And, and it's just a matter of uh, how they rate the policy. It's a little bit more expensive than your typical, but it's it, the reason for it is because they anticipate a whole lot more mileage out of that vehicle than the typical mom or dad that's driving to and from work getting groceries and doing those types of normal things, right? Thanks. But Sorry. you can still use your vehicle for all of those things as well. Um, Okay, and then, so then the commercial insurance then 
is, you know, and I, and I have the pictures of the vehicles up there because that's your, your, your normal, your pickup truck, your small delivery van, those types of things where you are carrying your product or you're pulling your machinery around, um, not typically using it to deal with uh, passengers much uh, other than the occasional client. Again, you might take one for lunch or something like that. Um, and that would be your commercial insurance. And then professional uh, use insurance. So th these are your businesses that rely, the vehicle is a key component to making their money. So taxi, limousine, professional truck drivers, charter bus services, uh, anything that involves uh, ferrying around of passengers for compensation and that type of thing. Usually you hold a specific type of uh, driver's license you know, class five is for pretty much everything else, but you get your class one for your long haul trucking, your class two for your busing, your, you know, your class uh, uh, two and four for limousine drivers and so forth. So when you're dealing with any of those special classes of driver's license, you've gotten into a category of professional use where you have some level of additional training to be a safe operator on the road. Um, so would a cab driver, for instance, would he be commercial or professional? Cab driver would be considered professional use. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. So when you're talking about business <coughs> use, going back to what um, this gentleman behind me was saying, um, if I'm using it for business and I don't have the business use insurance, um, where, where's the liability? If I've got a client in my car and I get into an accident mm -hmm. and I have to disclose that that's a client, I guess I'm kind of confused about the business use and the personal use. Why do you go to the business use? Okay, so there's a very important consideration in, in an insurance contract. One of the few things in auto insurance that an insurance company can use to deny a claim, and that is material misrepresentation. So if you have because an insurance contract, contracts between two parties typically deal in good faith. In good faith, I'm contracting with you to provide a service with the expectation that you're gonna pay me, right? In an insurance um, undertaking, it is elevated to the level of what we call utmost good faith, meaning that I am being completely honest with you and with the expectation that in doing so, you're gonna charge me that fair appropriate premium and my claims will be paid. Whereas if you don't disclose everything that you're doing and the insurance company is able to figure that out, they have the grounds to uh, deny a claim. So when you see things go to court, because you know you have the horror stories that everybody hears my insurance company is not paying my claims, it's usually on an utmost good faith denial basis. Somebody didn't tell somebody something and then it goes to court for the policyholder to prove, no, I actually did tell you, or that's actually not a material thing. It's, it's immaterial to what happened, right? So if you didn't have business use coverage and you were just going to get groceries for yourself, even though you use your vehicle for business, in that sense, sense driving to the grocery store, you have an accident, you're at fault, the claim is gonna get paid because you weren't using it for business. You have a client in the vehicle and somebody gets hurt and they sue you, because they got hurt, the insurance company says, well, we're not paying that because why are you ferrying around clients? You didn't tell us that, okay? Yeah, that clarified it, thank you. Yeah, all right. And so again, a little bit more, a little bit more uh, legal jargon. Um, negligence, basically, as individuals, you, are ex you owe everybody um, a responsibility to act the way a reasonable person would act in the delivery of your products and services. So that is called the duty of care. Um, a reasonable person acts in such a way, negligence is when you act outside of the way a reasonable person would, as defined by the courts. So it, it's, it's really um, a lot of words to, to basically say, you know, if you act appropriately, you do everything above board, you're fine. You start sub subverting from that and do things that regular people wouldn't do. You try to do something differently that, you know, your other competitors in your same industry wouldn't do because it's not, you know, it, it's not ethical or it's not, uh, it's not above board in some way. You're going to um, 
always be challenged on whether or not you were negligent and whether that negligence led to some sort of injury to your client or to another party. So, you know, for instance, in a, in a contractor scenario, you, you've got, uh, uh, say you're digging a basement for a new house that you're going to build and, you know, on lunchtime you're goofing around in the bobcat doing donuts and you take out the corner of the neighbor's house. This has happened, so I, this is not. This is this is right. That that's that's not that's not a a reasonable thing to be doing, or or for the public to be expecting that you're going to be behaving that way. And so when they damage your house because you were negligent in doing that, they have a case to say, okay, you were negligent. You caused damage to my house. Now pay for the repairs. And and to give an idea of how quickly these things can add up, that was. You know, five minutes of stupidity that costs them twenty thousand dollars. Okay, so it just—it's like that. Um, then the other, uh, so that's li—that's all called liability in tort. So that's all the kind of stuff that that uh, you have precedent for, and you know, case law and so forth. All kind of leads to all of these decisions that have been made over the years uh, in in Commonwealth countries that follow common law liability and tort and then the second component is liability and contract so you will enter into contracts as business owners it's just what business owners have to do whether to buy a piece of equipment to provide a service to you know, build a building to manufacture a widget whatever you will somebody will want to enter into a contract with you and there will be parts of that contract that have insurance components to it and so that's the liability and contract piece. Um, okay, so now to kind of get into specifics on the insurance. So commercial property insurance is really actually very straightforward. It's probably the most straightforward of, of everything with respect to um, commercial insurance. Very similar in, in a sense to homeowners insurance. You have stuff, you want to insure it against losing that stuff or that stuff getting damaged whether that be your buildings, your inventory and stock, your fixture, furniture, equipment in your buildings. Um, you know, and, and, and most businesses that have an office space will have some level of this. You may not own your building, you may just be leasing, um, but you will have uh, requirements to insure from the landlord as far as damages to their building. And they will wanna make sure that you have insurance in place uh, at least a good landlord will want to make sure you have insurance in place for um, your business contents and so forth so that if there is a, a loss there that they can have some reasonable expectation that you're not going to walk away from that lease because you're suddenly uh, bankrupt with no recourse to replace your your um, tools and equipment and so forth um, electronic data processing this is really old language for basically your POS systems your your various uh, computer systems and so forth. Um, I always want to clarify that that doesn't include mobile devices. That is something different. So your laptops, your your phones, and so forth, um, not included here when they go off premises. So this is all for stuff that stays on premises. And then specifically customer goods. If you're in a business where you bring customer goods back to your shop to work on them, fix them, and so forth, while they're in your care, custody, or control you're responsible for them, you can insure them. Um, and usually you would just put a rider on your insurance for X number of dollars. This is how much customer goods I ever have in my shop at any one time. And so if something happens, you have a fire or a flood or something, then you end up being able to cover that. Would that be for places like that service computers and that kind of thing and have other people's property there? You can. Um, typically where, where I see this kind of stuff happen, um, that is that's one. Uh, another example would be uh, an upholstery type uh, or carpet cleaning business where they're bringing, you know, uh, rugs and mats and so forth back to their shop to clean them before they deliver uh, again. Uh, and those types of things, furniture repair, um, small appliance and equipment repair, anything where they're physically, where you're physically pulling their equipment out of their premise and bringing it to yours, okay? Uh, Paul, we just have a question that came yep. in over Adobe sure. Connect. Uh, so the first one is, should operating a home office affect your homeowner's insurance, and how is that covered? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. It does uh, affect most homeowner's policies have uh, an exclusion built into 
uh, the policy wording which says, uh, and I'll, I'm paraphrasing here, but it basically says, if the loss to your house or your personal contents at your house arise from the operation of your business. Uh, so for instance, you're doing, I've got, a, I've got a client I'm working with right now. He, he moved out to an acreage, thought it was great. There was a great big detached shop uh, attached, or not detached, attached to his house, and he's a welder. Okay, so he's turned his double attached garage into a welding shop. If he burns that house down because he's welding in that shop, his house insurance will not respond. Okay, um, an oversight because he didn't know and he didn't ask. Okay, but that, that's the type of thing that will happen. So there are home based business riders that you can put onto your house insurance or a tenant insurance if you're living somewhere that you're renting, you can do that too. Typically, they're very limited in nature. They don't offer a lot of bells and whistles. Um, and typically, they don't cover you if you leave your house. So if you've got a phone and a computer and you can do everything can, with phone and computer and never leave your house, a home-based business package policy or extension on your house insurance is fine. Um, but if you ever actually set foot out the door to go work with clients, it doesn't usually extend to cover that. So. Is that your like physical premises? So like say if you talked about the welder, for example, if he had a guy mm -hmm. that came out to his garage, for mm -hmm. example, would that count as him leaving his home or him bringing, like would that change his insurance? No, a premises would be the pr your property, not just the physical building, okay? So, um, so basically where you end up in a situation where a general liability policy follows you wherever you go, anywhere, and depending on what you're doing and so forth, anywhere in Canada, anywhere in North America, anywhere in the world. Basically the kind of three different levels of, it, of, of liability insurance as far as an insurance company looks at it. Um, Home-based business liability, you know, if, if you are, I'll give you an example, you know, if you have kind of a, a hobby craft kind of business where, you know, maybe you make candles, um, you dip candles and so forth, and you go to the occasional farmer's market, you may be able to get a home-based business to cover the manufacturer, but sometimes that home-based business has, a, has an exclusion in it that says if you actually go to the farmer's market and attend your booth there, we're not going to extend a liability to that. So it it's breaks down and it's not very reliable as far as coverage, whereas a general liability policy with a, a property component can cover your stock, can cover your operations, can cover your tools and equipment at the house, and can cover all everything that you take with you to the farmer's market. So there, there's... Um, good reasons to have proper commercial insurance if you're going to be in business for yourself. We have another question that's kind of related as well. Okay. So if you have a business uh, that rents out, mm -hmm. say your inventory, mm -hmm. then uh, would the rented items be covered under the commercial property insurance? Again, uh, where, it, where it breaks down is when, you ha when your property, um, especially if you're renting it out and you're, and you're receiving income from it and it goes to somebody else, when they take care, custody, or control of that piece of equipment, they're responsible. You're no longer responsible for it, and therefore you can't insure it without some, you know, unless you're doing this as, a, as a, an actual business. You can buy insurance to do that. It can be very expensive. Typically what you see, so if you have, like, if you have a business similar to, say, a United Rentals that rents out construction equipment, um, you're going to want to have in your rental contract something that states that the person renting the, in, the equipment is responsible for insuring it. And on the flip side of that, you can put a rider on your policy to cover rented equipment. You just have a blanket statement, you know, I rent equipment all year long to do various different things and at any given time I might have up to $150,000 worth of that type of equipment in my, in my possession at various job sites and so forth. That's how you would, that's how you would expect to have your customers cover that for you, okay? I have a question in oh, regards sure. to the content. Mm -hmm. So if I have a large content, would I have to do an inventory of what I have? Say it's, um, I don't know, something, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So do I have to keep a running inventory at all times so that if something does happen, I can take it to you and say, this is what I have, or is it every three months, or how do you? You kind of, so you, you, you work, when you're a smaller business and you kind of know, you know, I've got thirty, forty, maybe fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment here. What I typically suggest people do is, okay, figure out what you have, and we're always on contents dealing with 
replacement cost. So if some of your stuff is five years old, but it's still very important, you want to deal with today's prices to replace it. Okay, so that's, that's what you're dealing with. You figure out um, what that amount is, and that's the limit that you insure. At the end of um, when you actually have an insurance claim, you do need to be able to prove what you've lost to the insurance company. They're just going to cut you a check. You need to be able to prove that, yeah, I actually did lose $30,000 worth of stuff. So the kind of the, the quick workaround for that, and it's really easy nowadays with, with digital uh, you know, cameras and phones and so forth, go room, for, go room to room. This is actually good, good for in your house as well. Go room to room, take a few photos here and there, and do that every few months. Keep them somewhere that's not on your business premises so that they don't get destroyed when your business gets destroyed. And then you can go in and at least at that point you can sit down and you can, say, you can look at these photos and go and just start making your list. And then you say that. When you have lots of equipment, lots of depreciable assets, um, the nice thing is, is your accountant's going to want to make you do an inventory anyway. So you're going to have a lot of that information already. The difference is, is that that will all be depreciated values for the accountant. You're going to want to have that list with two columns, one for the depreciated amortized values and one for what it's going to cost you if you have to buy it again. And then as long as you have that stuff in your um, uh, repertoire or in your you know, safety deposit box or your safe at home or wherever, if you can regenerate that information at the time of a claim, you should have... Uh, I wouldn't say it will be perfect and it will be easy, but you'll have a lot easier go of proving your claim. So, it's a good question. Uh, well, sure. uh, in my case, I want to uh, do a, like an on-site uh, mobile uh, car maintenance service. Mm -hmm. So, and eventually I want to hire somebody that they can go by themselves to a mm -hmm. person's house, right? Yeah. Um, what kind of insurance? Would they have to have their own insurance or would my commercial insurance cover uh, the service like uh, whoever could. Okay, so your question is probably more loaded than you think. <laughs> 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 when, it com when it comes to uh, servicing automobiles, anything in the automotive sector, there are specific insurance policies that you need in addition to anything that I'm going to talk about today mm -hmm. called garage auto insurance. And, and that's basically for insuring vehicles while the ones that aren't yours, but they're in your control. And so it's it's like the customer goods insurance, but written specifically for automobile, okay? So um, you have to have that. Then in the insurance, in insurance policy language, employees are um, additional insureds under your policy. So if it's ABC Contracting or ABC Mobile Mechanical Limited, and you have a number of employees, they are all working vicariously for you and so because of that any liability that happens because of the work they were doing on your behalf is as if you were doing it yourself and therefore covered under this policy if you hire independent contractors because you don't want to pay workers comp you don't want to pay cpp you don't want to do any of that stuff then they are independent business owners just like yourself they need to have all the same insurance that you do in order to protect uh, you from what they're doing for you, um, right? So if you have, um, you know, say a, one example would be, you know, you do all the mobile mechanical, but you're going to sub out the towing. You're going to hire a tow truck service to do that. They need to have their own insurance. If you get somebody set up completely on a rig of their own with all, you know, their own hoist and their own equipment, their own toolboxes and all of that stuff, Typically in mechanics, the, mecha the individual mechanic owns all of their own hand tools and so forth, whereas you might own the diagnostic equipment and some of the bigger pieces that they use. You insure all everything for them except for their tools. And they would, ha if they want to insure their tools, they can go and buy a policy to cover that. Or if you're a really nice owner, you can insure employee tools as well and probably get a better price than they would. <laughs> but sometimes you don't want to put out that extra cost because you don't know how long an employee is going to be with you and whether or not you want to make that investment in that particular employee. Okay. Um, yes? Independent contractors, if you do hire them, do you want to clarify, see that they are covered? And yes. So there is, an, there is a tool that we use called a Certificate of Liability Insurance. 
anybody that has a general liability policy can get a certificate. And basically what it's, the certificate holder would be yourself. The, uh, the insured party would be the subcontractor that you're hiring and it basically will, the certificate is gonna certify to you that they have various liability insurances that you require them to have. And so you're gonna say, I want you to have a minimum of you know, $2 million worth of liability insurance for this because you use your vehicle um, doing work for me, I want you to have $2 million of automobile liability insurance as well. And maybe there's some other specialty things on there that you want them to have. And all of that would show up on their certificate. And with a clause on that that says that if they cancel their insurance or have some sort of substantial material change to their insurance, they reduce their insurance from $2 million to $1 million. Usually it's a 15 or 30 day clause that the insurance company will notify you saying, hey, this guy that you're working with, he's made changes to his insurance. Or worse, his insurance has been canceled because he didn't pay his bill or whatever the case is, okay? So you want to do that kind of stuff. That is a, a, another layer of protection for you to make sure that you're dealing with businesses that find this stuff just as important as you do and want to protect your customers just as much as you do, okay? So another good, good question. Um, so specialty property insurance or package policies, I refer to them as, these are policies that are built for various different types of businesses. So there's packages for retailers, there's packages for contractors, there's packages for uh, garages, there's packages for salon owners, there's packages for all kinds of these um, businesses where there's a lot of these types of businesses, they're very generic, and they offer a lot of um, the various coverages that business owners need. So your, your, your liability, your contents, your uh, building if you have one, uh, as well as business interruption coverage, um, which you know, if, you ha if you have a retail store for instance and your store burns down and you can no longer be open and selling your wares, this policy would step in to pay uh, that portion of uh, variable and um, you know, not fixed uh, expenses as well as a portion of the type of revenue that you are accustomed to generating for a specified period of time. It can be uh, as much as three years, you know, depending <coughs> on the type of business and how long it would take for you to set your business back up. Um, and in that you can also cover off key employee wages and so forth so that you don't, if you're down for 12 months and and your employee is sitting at home twiddling their thumbs and they're looking for other work, you can continue to pay them. They can continue to help you get your business set back up. And you don't have to worry about that, okay? How does replacement value work for, let's say businesses that have memberships like a gym, let's say a gym burns down or something along mm -hmm. that line. Uh, how can you replace a perceived amount of clients? Like, would you say I normally have 100 clients Mm -hmm. Do they take that from the day that burned down, that's what you have? With well, you, typically what uh, they'll do when they're adjusting a, a, a business income claim is that they will take a look at your financial statements, okay? So in, in business income uh, coverage, in the wording that goes with that coverage, it will say that at any time that the insurance adjuster <coughs> wants to look at your financial statements, you have to let them, okay? So it's not, it's not optional. If they want to audit you, they will audit you so that, they, that they're working with you to prove that you actually have this much income uh, so that your claim will proceed, right? But they're also, uh, on the utmost good faith side, they're also expecting that you're going to allow them to investigate to make sure that you're not inflating your claim, exaggerating things and so forth, right? So when you have that scenario, they're going to look at a full year or maybe even three years of financial statements and they're going to say, look at any given point Say this is his three or four months of peak sales. This is what his typical is in a three to four month period. And they usually use your largest months to make sure that they're not undercutting you on, you know, by, by any, uh, any dollars. And then they'll average that out over however long you're actually closed, okay? They're not going to say, they're not going to look at it on the basis of, you know, he had 100 clients last year, 150 this year, and so we expect he would have 200 by this time next year because you can't really predict that. So yes, it would kind of stop where you are at the time of the claim, okay? Um, very good reason to make sure that you're keeping your books 
I know a lot of small business owners like to do all of, hand everything off to their bookkeeper at the end of the year. You really need, I can't stress enough how important it is to keep your books up to date all the time if you want claims like this to go well. Okay. Um, course of construction insurance, that is a very construction specific insurance. That's how to insure a building while it's being built. Um, I won't get into that too much. Um, some of the specialty liability insurance, so I was talking about consultants and so forth. We refer to that as errors and omissions insurance when it comes to anybody that's not in a medical field. Otherwise, you probably have all heard of medical malpractice coverage, which would be errors and omissions for medical professionals. Um, environmental impairment. Basically, if your negligence leads to something that is harmful to the environment, um, you know, you've caused, you've spilled something that is a pollutant and you have to, you know, deal with cleanup, um, or there's legislation <coughs> involved around a certain thing that you're doing, you're transporting hazardous goods, any of those types of things, you may need to have uh, specific types of environmental coverage. So that picture there, and just to give you an idea of, and, and, and everybody is always surprised on this picture here, so somebody spilled a pollutant into a into a river into a stream and killed all kinds of fish and so the Canadian version of the Environmental Protection Agency I don't even know what it's called but everybody here is in the movies EPA in the US we have similar legislation here for cleanup and restoration restocking the fish because they're all dead um, getting everything clean, you know cleaned up and so forth this particular claim $750,000 because they spilled something into the into the river. The pollutant was milk. Okay, so trucker carrying milk. So I'm not a scientist, but apparently milk takes the oxygen out of water, so it kills all the fish. So there are there are things that you wouldn't think of. And so, I mean, that's, that's your job to raise those questions and to think about it. It's my job to research and figure it out and then get the coverage that you need um, to deal with that stuff. Paul, is, so. is there a line in the sand somewhere that separates the business's liability versus an employee's negligence? So, for example, the environmental impairment, what if my truck driver was drunk mm -hmm. and tipped the truck over and that's what caused the milk to enter the river or the water system? So is that yeah. his liability because he was drunk? Or is it the business liability because he was in a business vehicle at the time of the accident? Um, potentially both. Typically, in a situation like that where somebody is grossly negligent, they've done, you know, they've broken the law. Um, a business owner, there, there is certain things, especially with auto insurance, where there's absolute liability. You are required as a business owner, expected as a business owner, to have qualified people driving your vehicles, people you don't expect to do stupid things like drive drive a, a vehicle drunk and, and so forth. So when you have that happen, as the registered owner of the vehicle, you are going to get sued. Whether you own that personally in a partnership or in a corporation, that entity that owns that vehicle is going to get sued. Okay, How much of the liability rests with you as the owner, typically in a situation like that, will be determined by the courts. And I will never <coughs> try to guess what the courts will decide to do because it changes all the time. Um, directors and officers liability. If you are getting involved in a, uh, a business with multiple shareholders, um, you know, say three, four, five partners, maybe they're all family, maybe they're not, this is insurance that protects the directors from each other. So if one director makes a bad decision that sewers the business, the other four directors sue that individual. If you're that individual that made the bad decision, you want to make sure that you're protected. But so do the other partners. So you want to make sure that you consider this. Um, typically, I wouldn't suggest that you really need it if you're more than or, or, or less than three directors. Um, and again, it's a case by case. If you, it's family, it's, you know, husband, wife, and one of their kids, and this is what we do, and we've done this forever, and we all trust each other, and so forth. You may choose, you know, we don't need this, it's just a small business. Um, I'll give you an example, though. Had, a, had a, a client, they actually ended up going bankrupt. Um, and this will dovetail into the employment practices liability as well. They had to let everybody go. 
Okay, but they let everybody go right away. At law, you have to give everybody two weeks severance minimum. Okay, they let everybody go right away because they shut the doors. They had no money left. One of the two brothers, whatever money he had personally, um, oh, years of wages and dividends and so forth, he had taken, he had actually squandered that money by spending too much time in Vegas. The other brother, you know, married, kids, everything else, had got, moved on with life. He actually started another business and so forth. The employees, did a, uh, I don't know if I'll call it a class action suit, but they all sued because none of them got paid. And so that was a substantial amount of money. They had 30, 40 employees at you know, two weeks each. That, that's you know, probably three, four, five months of, of salary that they had to deal with. And that one brother that still had his money left, he got taken to the cleaners and he got cleaned out personally because he couldn't hide behind the fact that um, the business had gone down. Okay. Um, Is that a, sorry. Is that a sole proprietorship? That was a, corp that was a corporation where the two corporation. brothers were shareholders. But, it, but employment, uh, um, you know, what you owe your employees, it doesn't matter if it's a corporation or if it's a partnership or if it's a sole proprietorship. I mean, in a sole proprietorship, you're not going to have directors and officers insurance anyway because you can't sue yourself. You can only sue your other partner, right? If there's not another partner, there's no one to sue. Um, so then moving on to the employment practices, you're going to, once you have employees, you're gonna get into positions where you have, you know, an employee that might not be performing to what you expect or you have some other reason that you need to terminate their employment. There's laws around how to do that properly. Um, it's not an easy process. You know, you wanna document everything for as much time as you can, can manage having that. You know, sometimes you have to keep an employee around for six months longer than you wanted to just so that you can build a file to justify their dismissal. If you can't justify their dismissal or, and you let them go without cause, or they at least think that you have and they sue you for wrongful dismissal, that employment practices liability covered is an add-on that you can buy to protect yourselves from those types of things. So. As long as you acted with all due diligence to make sure you followed the law and you did everything properly and they sue you anyway, this can pay for that defense. And sometimes even pay for the judgment of, you know, the court said, you should have given them six months severance instead of four. You're going to have to pay them the extra two. This, this coverage would actually provide those funds. Okay. Um, the other stuff is all very construction specific. Is anybody going, starting a construction type business? if you're not, then I'm going to skip over this. I, stuff. We do have someone do you? by Adobe Connect that is in a construction-like business. Okay. Um, so surety bonding, it's not actually insurance, okay? But it is a product that's primarily provided by insurance brokers and insurance companies. Basically, this is ensuring that, you're, that you fulfill your contract, that you have the financial strength to actually do what you're going to say that you're going to do. Um, so you, you go through and it's, it's, if you're dealing with your bank and they're looking at your financial statements to decide if they're going to lend you money and so forth, the process to that is very similar. But here what they're doing is they're actually making sure that you have a certain working capital base that you can leverage to go build, bid on projects that you don't actually have specifically the cash to do, but you've shown that over the years you can manage your cash flow to pay all your bills on time and everything else. And so they will you know, prop you up and provide you uh, the ability to say to these potential clients that yes, they will be able to fulfill this contract. We guarantee it. We are sure that they will do it. And so when you do that, now if you're wrong and you end up shutting a business or you have to walk away from something because you can't do it and the other party calls in this bond, then this bonding company will pay to hire somebody else to finish the work that you couldn't do. And the difference between what you were going to charge and what they were going to charge uh, and whatever money you weren't able to, uh, to complete uh, for this client, you will have to pay it all back. You will be personally responsible for it all. So this is something that you don't get into very early on in a, in a new business. It's something that, you know, even a, if you're looking at, give you, because it's contracting basis, I'll throw out some names uh, and I'll throw out ones that, uh, that everybody's heard of, like Ward Brothers Construction, Silver Ridge Construction, you know, some of these really big contractors around town, 
PCL, big ones internationally, and so forth, they have these programs in place. Um, sometimes they require their subtrades, though. If you're a heating and air conditioning guy or a plumber or something along those lines, sometimes they need you to be able to get this coverage in place as well so that they can not only leverage themselves but leverage you to be able to bid on jobs that are bigger. Okay. Steps to get that bond is it quite detailed? It takes can it, be denied? it can be denied because you have to have financial strength. Because like I said, they also want to be reasonably assured that if something goes wrong, you can personally pay them back. Right? So if you're wanting to bid on jobs that are three, four, five, ten million dollars they want to know that between all the partners and everything else that you have going on, that if they had to wipe you out to collect on all of that, they could and they would get, they would end up breaking even. They won't lose money. Is there certain levels of bonding that you? Provide? Yeah, and it's it's all financially based. So you, the, you're you will become more eligible for more levels of bonding based on how much money you actually can put up into the relationship. Okay, so um, typically. They will look at your current, your liquid assets, your cash, your accounts receivable. They say, okay, so they've got five hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff that's going to turn into cash fairly quickly, and so then they will leverage that for you anywhere from five to twenty-five times, depending on what you're doing. Is there a for um, No, but typically, unless you've got uh, significant financial strength yourself. You're not going to look into this unless you can provide, you know, three to five years worth of financial statements. You're going to want accountant versions of those statements. They're not the internal ones you produce yourself out of QuickBooks. They're the ones that the accountant produces. Um, and depending on how big you want to get and how much you want to get, sometimes they will require, you know, there's three different types of accounting statements. There's the notice to reader, which is the very, very basic, basically the bookkeeper handed it off to the accountant. The accountant gave you a financial statement to show your bank. Or, you know, there's review engagement where the accountant's more involved, and then of course there's the audit where, you know, they basically so, tear your business apart so and put it back together again. Year, Not um, likely going to happen. Even if the uh, the net worth of the directors were high and they could borrow against it. If you have similar experience from a previous business, or you know, if you've had, you know, each of the business owners have had business. Uh, experience in, in similar industries, you may be able to leverage the experience. It's not always just about the money. They also want to know that that you have a track record. So they will interview suppliers, they will interview customers, they will look at all kinds of things to make sure that your experience and the experience that the people you do business with is all positive. And then the financials is what really drives it home after that. So for a corporation, will they uh, look at the personal assets for bonding of the uh, owners if it's a corporation? Yes. Yes, you will have to sign personal guarantees. And so and if you have multiple companies, sometimes you start a company here, but you've already had three, you have three other companies that do different things, they may also require you to sign guarantees for all of those companies. It all depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so... So if I've got a client, they've got five partners, they all have two holding companies each. I've got what we call an indemnity agreement or a personal guarantee, corporate guarantee, on five individuals and 10 companies, plus the one that they're all part of, right? So it's very complex, but they also bond tens of millions of dollars every year, so. Does Westland bond? Yes, yeah. Well, Westland, not we're brokers, so we go to the surety or insurance company. So, but yes, I do that work. I've got a lot of uh, clients that do that stuff. Yes, sorry. Um, you mentioned in your example that um, for that corporation, um, when they got sued, they were they came after them personally. Mm -hmm. So how come the corporation in that case, or what are some examples? I'm thinking specifically to errors and omissions. So I'm okay. thinking of a consulting business. Mm -hmm. And I have to, I believe I have to form a corporation to um, distance myself uh, for, you know, for the liability reasons. Right. So it's not, if nothing's 100%, you know, cut and dry that I'll be protected because it is, it is me, mm -hmm. ultimately, <coughs> the, on the other side of the consulting. 
Um, but I don't know what the right question is. When am I protected? When am I not protected? And um, maybe just a bit, maybe one example on errors and omissions. Okay. So to backtrack a bit, um, incorporating is a layer of protection it, that, that separates your business from you personally, okay? Where that breaks down is in areas where you can't distance yourself because you are the controlling mind of that organization. So you can't necessarily hide behind a bankruptcy, for instance, to walk away from everything, okay? In the instance of, say, paying um, em employees and so forth. If you've had a, ha you know, a history of of pulling dividends and so forth out of your company and, and and you know a lot of business owners don't necessarily build up lots of equity in their business they strip that equity away every year in paying themselves dividends on top of you know whatever you know moderate salary that they pay on to pay themselves to do the various job functions that they do within the business right that's why you strive to make a profit that's why a business owner goes into business is to get those those dividends and so forth if you have a history of always doing that and ripping it out and you're the controlling mind and you knew that your business was tanking and you still were pulling that stuff out, you can't hide behind that. The courts will come after you to on behalf of those employees that you didn't pay. Okay, so that's on the employment side. On the errors and omissions side, so if you're an architect or an engineer or something along those lines, um, typically the professional designation is, is issued to you as an individual. All right, uh, but you do have to form a professional corporation um, in, for some of those different occupations at law. And so it's intended to separate the assets of the business of the corporation and protect the employees from some of the things that you're doing as the consultant. But again, as the controlling mind, as the person that actually holds that designation, you can be held personally responsible. So when you buy an errors and omissions policy, Typically, you buy it in the name of yourself personally and your corporation. Or if you buy it in the corporation, then they en endorse protection on for you as an individual as well. So that whether the organization gets sued or you personally get sued, you're covered either way. Okay, But there's, there's no such thing as a perfect line of defense when it comes to liability. A lawyer's job is to drive a truck through it. <laughs> That's why they get paid what they get paid their job is solely to find the money. I mean, that's a crass way of saying what a lawyer's job is, but that is what people hire lawyers to do. And okay. the level of coverage? You will buy, very, you know, you buy as much as you can afford, is what I tell people. You buy as much as you can afford. Some people have higher risk tolerances than others, so some people only say, I don't want to buy more than $2 million of coverage. Some people don't want to buy more than $500,000 worth of coverage. Some people want $10 million because they're afraid of everything. Right, and, and sometimes their business is hazardous enough that they should be, right? Like, I, I you know. Yeah. So there's going to be certain things that the, you know, uh, a PEGA is going to require you to have. For instance, that's the Association of Professional Engineers. Um, they're going to require you to have certain things just to be a, just to be a member of their association. Um, what they require usually is the bare minimum of what you should have, right? So just, just I'll get to you in a second, just to give you an example. So you've, you've engineered a design, whether you're an engineer or maybe you're an architect, whatever, you design this building and it's, um, you know, it's a $10 million high rise, you know, or $100 million high rise in Calgary, you know, is a $250,000 errors and omissions coverage enough? If what you know you do on a foundation says you know it's wrong and the building collapses probably not right so but if you're typically doing small additions to small commercial buildings in a place like Lethbridge you know you're adding a three wall addition to a small building to maybe even double its size and it's going from 2,500 to 5,000 square feet 250,000 may be plenty for that type of stuff okay so I'm not sure if I think my question sort of lines up with hers. Let's okay. say I'm a self-proclaimed photocopy expert. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And a company wants to do an RFP or something to and hire a consultant to give them advice on how to drop an RFP for photocopies or evaluate a bid or something. Mm -hmm. And I give them bad advice, mm -hmm. and they end up going with the wrong vendor. And everything goes to hell. So. Can they sue me? And I presume they could sue me because I give bad advice. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not, you know. So what do I, do I go for errors or omissions? And, and the other, and the other part of my question is: so I'm halfway through the whole consulting process and I get hit by a bus and I can't finish the contract in time by their deadline. Mm -hmm. So now they sue me because I haven't finished it. So is there insurance for that type of thing? Is that okay? What? To the second one, that's more of a life insurance question, key man insurance coverage and so forth. Okay. okay. Um, on, on the first side. Errors and omissions insurance is for professionals. You have to be able to prove that you're a professional in that space. And so I give the obvious examples of engineers, architects, yeah. et cetera, because they have you know, more additional specific training and so forth to do that work. Insurance broker, I have specific training to do what I do. Uh, accountants and so forth. You can have 30 years experience and be the most prolific photocopier in town. Does not make you an expert. <laughs> well, that's, okay. So there's really nothing, there's no protection for that type of individual. Right? No, but if you take it to a, a step further, if you're a print shop and you're actually designing ads and so forth and you're doing graphic design and so forth, graphic design, yes, errors and omissions. Printers eat errors and omissions and so forth. There's coverage for that. Uh, um, but, you know, if you're just a, if you're a photocopier sales guy and everybody thinks you, you know everything about photocopiers that are always calling on you, that's great, <laughs> but it doesn't make you a professional uh, or an expert in photocopying to the extent of of the uh, because other people of their own volition using photocopiers getting into the business can learn that hands on as opposed to getting specific additional training. So well, cancel that business idea. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're underinsured or not insured for something. I'm sure it would probably depend if you're incorporated or a sole proprietor or whatever, but somebody sues you, the court awards them what they're suing you for, you can't pay it. Um, what can they take from you? Can they take your house? Do you just have to declare bankruptcy? Do you lose your business? Like, how does that work? That's where the layer of protection comes in from the you know, corporation and, you know, and so forth. So you set up the corporation to, to give you a, a layer of protection from that very thing happening. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if you get sued for $2 million and you have a $1 million policy and the court actually awards them more than $1 million, they might not award the whole $2 million, but the corporation is going to be responsible for whatever that judgment is. Mm -hmm. Insurance is only going to pay to the limit that you purchased. Right? Okay. And so beyond that, you may have to sell off business assets and so forth. If you are, you know, in some ways, depending on the situation, you may be able to walk away from the corporation after it's all been liquidated and get to keep your house. If you've put your house up as collateral for some of the stuff that you've borrowed and you can't pay back those entities that you've borrowed from and that stuff is lost as well, that's where you may lose your house. It's not an insurance issue, but it's all the other you know, financial components can enter into that. Because, um, you know, insurance is one financial pillar. The, the banks and lending institutions are another financial pillar, right? And so you're trying to work all of that stuff together to keep cash flow going, but as well protect and provide yourself that safety net so that if something catastrophic like that does happen, you live to fight another day. Just so keep your business open tomorrow. So it depends but what collateral and assets you put in and equity from the beginning. Mm -hmm for the business, okay. Yeah, and that's not necessarily an insurance thing, so much as if the insurance proceeds aren't enough to keep your business open, you might lose all that stuff because you've signed personal guarantees and so forth to, to, to borrow 500,000 to buy that special piece of equipment that your business needs. And that's only if you're incorporated, like if you have no. a sole proprietorship and you haven't put your, up your house as collateral, can they still take it from you? If you are a sole proprietorship, you have no additional layer of protection. The insurance is it. Like if the, and if the insurance isn't enough, they can take everything. Oh. Yeah. So I, I recommend everybody be incorporated. Accountants don't always agree because they want you to have a certain amount of money for it to make tax sense. I don't care about taxes from that perspective. Liability to me is way more important and cause a whole lot more headache than whether or not you can save $500 on your tax bill at the end of the year. But that's the accountant's perspective and that's what they get paid to do. And the lawyer is going to have a slightly different perspective. Right? The lawyer is going to come from the perspective of you don't need to buy a million dollars. If a million dollars is enough, you just hire me and I'll defend you. Right? <laughs> but how can you hire them after you've already lost a million dollars? 
Right? <laughs> so it's a whole different. Um, so if you get all three on the same page, then that's uh, and it's not always easy. Yes. So is that part of what um, we can't do with the any error conditions for this? Um, whose whose expertise would say, okay, put all your assets in your spouse's name, do this? <coughs> where you know what? Where do we get that You're kind? going to deal with your accountant and financial advisor for that advice. Okay. Some insurance brokers do some of that as well. My recommendation is that you, I don't think, I mean, I don't do life insurance. I don't do financial planning. I only do liability and property insurance. There is far too much complexity in all of those areas to be able to be an expert in all of them. My recommendation is you might want to deal with the same firm. Like, you know, if Westland Insurance has a life insurance person and a person like myself and somebody that does personal insurance, you might want to deal with three different people all at the same firm. Or you might want to deal with, you know, myself for this part. And you might want to deal with somebody specifically for your financial planning that, you know, has expertise in, in you know, financial planning for your particular type of business. You know, you ask the financial planner, do you have lots of engineers as clients? You know, interview them. Get, get, you know, have, you know, and, and I get the same questions myself. You know, do you have lots of engineers as clients? Do you have lots of, you know, home builders as clients? Do you have lots of retailers as clients, auto dealers, whatever? Right? They're going to want to go to somebody that has a certain amount of expertise. Um, so you you're going to want to get different pieces of advice. You're going to want to be comfortable enough at some <coughs> point to have all of those individuals feel free to talk to each other to get overall your best interest working in the same direction. But, I mean, that's usually several years down the road as far as, as trying to figure out how all of that works, getting the accountant and the lawyer and the financial planner and so forth all to agree and get to that point is a lot of talking. Um, okay. <clears throat> like it, I was thinking, uh, most of us, I think, we're not experts in insurance, mm -hmm. so we go to you for insurance, and you're the expert, and I tell you, yeah, I need insurance for this business, like mm -hmm. I need everything, so I'm not liable, mm -hmm. and you don't give me the right insurance, mm -hmm. so in that case, am I liable? Yes. yes, and that's why I have errors in mission. <laughs> 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 Okay, but you know, at the end of the day, what you do is you, you come, you tell me you're starting this type of business and I just start asking you questions. I know I'm trained to ask questions to get to the root of what it is that you're doing to understand your business. So I know a little bit about a lot of businesses, okay? I'm not an expert in anybody's business. I'm an expert in insurance and that's what I do. And, and so, yes, you know, you're gonna ask me for a number of questions, I'm going to give, I'm also smart enough to know from a consulting perspective, I'm going to give you advice that you might not take. Because then I can say, I gave it to you, you didn't take it, not my problem. Okay, and that's what a consultant is going to do regardless of whether it's insurance law or whatever. <laughs> They're going to say, here's what I re recommend, now it's up to you, we've had the conversation. I document that you didn't take it, so I protect I myself, and where that fails, the errors and emissions insurance kicks in. So I can do that with my independent contractors, I can say, you have to have insurance to go do my job if you don't get it. That's you. Well, no, because that's that's a different. So the difference there is that um, like errors and omissions is there because I am giving advice that you're relying on. When you send somebody else to do the work and they don't have insurance, if you're the if you're the general contractor, and I use that term loosely, being you, you're the you're the person that the customer hired. They don't care whether you did it yourself or you hired somebody else they're gonna sue you because that's who the invoice came from. Okay, and if it didn't happen and this other individual that you hired didn't buy insurance, as a general contractor, I'm not talking just construction trades, any trade, anyone where you are the prime con contract holder with the client, you're responsible to make sure that that work was done. Okay, so you want to make sure that you're only dealing with sub-trades and consultants and so forth that have the appropriate stuff in place because that's gonna protect you from the things that they've done on your behalf, okay? So just real quick, this is the last slide of my presentation here, so just really quick, 
there's there's two types of insurance professionals out there. There are insurance agents, there's insurance brokers. I am an insurance broker, which means that I represent you to multiple insurance companies. I shop, I basically shop you around to find uh, what's best. I don't, I don't get paid specifically by any one insurance company more than any other. It just, I find the right fit for what you guys are doing. Insurance agents, if you think cooperators, State Farm, Allstate, those ones, that agent only sells cooperators, State Farm, Allstate products. I sell multiple insurance companies, so I'm allowed to find different things. Uh, additionally, an insurance agent is only the salesperson. Um, they may give some advice when, as part of what they're doing for sales, but if you have a claim, they are not involved. Okay. Whereas if you have a claim and you're dealing with an insurance broker, a good insurance broker, when that claim is going off the rails, that insurance broker's job is to actually get involved and get things back on track okay. where, where they can. I mean, sometimes it's not something that's insured, so it's not necessarily miracle workers, but we certainly know how to get things back <coughs> if it should be covered. And an insurance adjuster is, you know, um, not working with you in in, the, in good faith. And, and sometimes that happens because, you know, insurance get a rookie insurance adjuster just like a rookie anybody. They don't necessarily know all the answers, and they might feel compelled to make stuff up rather than ask questions. And and sometimes you get caught um, in the crosshairs on stuff like that. Do both work on commission? Hmm? Do both work on commission? So. For instance, uh, insurance companies pay insurance agents, brokers on commission, yes. Um, but typically, you, we end up in a situation, so for instance, I don't work on commission. My agency does, right? So we get paid commission by the insurance companies for selling their products. We don't make decisions on which products to sell based on the level of commission. And it actually gets really easy because with all of our insurance companies, the commissions are the same for all of them. Mm. Like we've negotiated that you know it's a certain commission level for this type of product from all you know 10, 12, 15 insurance companies that we deal with. Insurance brokers and agents though can work directly on commission. So usually what happens is. Um, the agency or the brokerage gets paid on commission and then they turn around and portion that commission out to the individual producer. So if they get paid you know, $1,000 in commission, the agent might get half of that directly as their salary, you know, rather than salary. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yes and no, it all depends on the structure. Most of the brokerages in Lethbridge, um, well, I shouldn't say most, it's probably about a 50-50 split of ones that where the individual that you're talking to across the table is getting paid on whatever they sell you and those of us that get paid a salary. So I can give you all the advice, I can have all the conversation I, and not worry about whether I'm going to feed my kids, right? I'm, mm -hmm. just, I'm there to give you specific examples of things. It allows me to be picky and choosy as well as to which clients I want because mm -hmm. I don't want everybody mm -hmm. because some are going to be ones where I'm looking at it going, it's not <coughs> waiting to happen. I don't want to pay all of these claims and I can avoid it at the outset. Whereas somebody that is um, needing, you know, that that commission income, they might make different decisions and, and it's great in the early stages, but it might not be good for them long term. And it might not, you might end up buying things you don't need or, you know, they're willing to sell you stuff that's less than what you need because they just want to make the same. Right. So there, there's that, and that actually comes to the trusted advisor versus order taker. So the trusted advisor is going to be somebody that works with you to make sure that you're getting what you need, not more, not less. You're trying as best they can to get you what you need, giving you advice, letting you make good business decisions, letting you decide what your own risk tolerance is and so forth. Um, whereas the order taker is you're going to come in and you're going to say, you know what, I need a million dollars of this, and they're going to say, okay, here's the policy, it's $600, carry on. And whereas you might actually not have needed that at all. Um, I'll give you an example. I talked to somebody today. Um, their existing broker was telling them that they needed $10 million of coverage um, for this contract that they were trying to enter in. They never saw the contract. They never looked at it. I do business for them as well on a different, I actually do their bonding, okay? Uh, but I didn't take care of the other stuff. And I said, that seems really odd. It seems really high given the type of business that you're in and so they sent me the portion of the contract and it was a contract with the city of Lethbridge 
where the contract actually says the city is taking out the $10 million in coverage and um, adding this contractor on as an additional insured under that policy. So they didn't need to buy the $10 million at all. And so that was, for me, a win today because I took the rest of the business from them. <laughs> but, that was, but it wasn't because I sold them more than they needed. I actually sold them less. I actually sold them what they needed and explained to them why. Right? And so that's the trusted advisor versus the order taker. So, and that's what we try to be at, at Westland. So I'm not here soliciting any business. That's not why I do this. Um, I've been a partner with Community Futures for the last well, four or five years. Um, I've been doing this presentation for uh, four years. This is number four. And you know what? It's just I deal with entrepreneurs and business owners all the time. And uh, you know, I want to make sure that people are educated and making good decisions when it comes to protecting themselves and having you know, the potential for success. So I did bring business cards. So if you want to add additional questions, you know, things that come up later, my email is on there. I do deal with my clients first, because that's what pays the bills, I'll be honest. <laughs> but if you do, and, and I will get to questions. So sometimes it might take two or three days to, you know, um, but feel free to grab a card, send me an email. And if, you know, it's by some chance you do want to do business with me, I'm happy to sit down with anybody. But that's not why I'm here. So. Paul, All I right. just got two quick questions sure. that came in over Adobe Connect. Are there types of businesses that you cannot insure? So in this example, her insurance uh, person told her that they were unable to insure a catering type business. I am of the um, firm belief that you can insure anything. It's whether or not you want to pay the premium for that insurance. <laughs> it's the truth. Um, I mean, you listen to things, you watch the entertainment, you know, and you have you know, celebrities insuring their various body parts, whatever, because that's their money make. You can insure anything, okay? But the premiums can be, um, you know, different. Different insurance companies don't always want to insure every type of business. That doesn't mean insurance doesn't exist. It means that that particular agent or broker you're talking to doesn't have an insurance company that likes that particular industry. Um, we are fortunate enough to be in a position that we have you know, 15 insurance companies that we contract with directly. We have access to Lloyd's of London, and so we can do pretty much anything, <laughs> okay? But again, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to like the premium. You might think that being a dynamite manufacturer is a great idea and you know how to do it. You might not want to pay the insurance premium for such a high hazard type business. And then uh, the second question, uh, this one's kind of loaded, I'll say right off the bat. Are some brokers better than others, or are they all basically the same? No, absolutely some are better than others. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's no different. Some accountants are better than others. Some lawyers are better than others. And, and you're going to need to find somebody that you're comfortable with. You're going to need to find somebody that when you interview them can, you know, not uh, stumble over their answers to your questions and so forth. You're going to need to find somebody that's willing to spend the time to talk to you and answer your questions. And more importantly than anything else, you're going to need to find somebody that when they don't know the answer, they tell you they don't know and they go find it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So others that just you know make everything up on the fly, you get the pretty quick judge of character on, on knowing. And of course, you know you have insurance professionals do have designations that are specific to insurance, and so um, you know there are definitely different levels. You want just ask somebody how much experience they have in insurance, how long have they been doing it, what types of businesses do they insure, and they might say, I'm just starting to get into business insurance, I've been doing personal home and auto for the last 10 years, and I'm just starting to do some business stuff. That might not be the right person for you. It could be your sister, it could be your brother, aunt, uncle, whatever, and you might say, you know what, I'm going to continue to support them, because they're going to support me, and that's fine too, but you know, you just got to understand what you're going to get into. So. All right, Perfect. any other questions? Are there ways that you can take measures to reduce your premiums? Like, for example, you have fire insurance on your mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. and you have a basic sprinkler system, but then you go above and beyond and get like fire detectors and flame detectors and go all that. Can that reduce your premiums at all? Or is it just straight replacement costs no matter what you do? So when you're dealing with, um, say, personal home insurance and you add you know, a burglar alarm you're going to get a discount. When you add a uh, intrusion or a fire alarm onto that, you're going to get a discount. When you add water sensors onto that alarm system, you know, so that if you go away and you get somebody gets notified that your hot water tank broke, you know, you, 
get additional discounts for that. There is some of that in commercial insurance as well, but what it tends to be is that in order to insure a specific type of business, it needs to meet minimum standards for construction of a type of building. If you're a welding shop, the insurance company is not really keen on a business housed in a wood frame building. Okay, they prefer that you were in a concrete or steel building. Um, same thing is is you know if, if the various processes that your business has. Uh, one example, a wood shop. If you're a carpenter, cabinet maker, that type of business, <coughs> you're wanting to get into that. You don't have a proper dust collection system in your business or a sprinkler system, a lot of insurance companies won't insure them anymore because all the loose dust and everything is highly combustible and there's it's just a clean <coughs> reading. Um, so there's all of those things. So you need to meet minimum standards. Once you meet the minimum standards, then if you start doing some of those additional things and increasing your deductibles and doing other things like that, you can certainly work towards reduced premiums. And when you're very proactive in doing those types of things, insurance underwriters actually uh, really appreciate that type of, uh, or that level of <coughs> respect for loss control and so and, and, and dealing with your own risk and so then they're usually willing to work with you. And, and at a certain point you might find that one insurance company is no longer able to do what you're doing because you've, you've outgrown an insurance company. They, they like businesses of this size and this makeup and you say, I'm gonna do this you might need to go to another insurance company that can now handle that as well. And that's, so then when you're dealing with an insurance broker, a broker has the access to other insurance companies, whereas you deal with uh, an agent that's dealing with one insurance company, you know. So I give you an, ex I've got lots of, I get lots of referrals from State Farm, for instance, because they can do small business stuff, but when they expand and grow, like they're trying to do, at a certain point they outgrow that and then I get a referral and say, you know, or whatever, and, and say well, they've outgrown us. Maybe you can help them, and you know, so that stuff happens. Yeah. Um, for corporations, shareholders are they liable? I don't know if that's directors insurance, but let's say mm -hmm. it was less than three people. Like, are shareholders liable to to anything that you know? Say it. Um, as me as an engineer, and I have errors and emissions insurance, mm -hmm. but I want my husband to be a shareholder in the corporation. Is he liable for anything as a shareholder? Um, for him, probably not personally to the extent that you might be, because you're not. He's not the one providing the consulting advice and so forth. Um, but a shareholder. Um, a shareholder is an additional insured under the policy, just like the employees, right? As as is a spouse. So even if, so if you're married and you have a corporation, and he's not part of the business, he's not a shareholder. He can still be liable, um, but he would be covered under the policy because he's a spouse of a director or a shareholder. Okay, so the the it. it but again, it, it's there's very specific cases where the insurance and the corporation don't necessarily fully protect you. And there's just nothing that can be done. Some things truly are, I hate to use the word uninsurable because we were just talking about everything's insurable, but certain circumstances at law, insurance is not there to protect you from that. Some stuff is just simply a cost of doing business and the reason why you have to do business above board and carefully. You've got to be measured and thoughtful in what you do so to even, avoid that stuff. Even if I put the assets in my husband's name solely, mm -hmm. that's still... Um, to, so, to some degree. So, for instance, if you're, if you're a business that has all kinds of equipment and vehicles and so forth to do everything, and you have a holding company that in, owns all of that stuff, but then you have a second company that actually goes out and does business and just borrows equipment and whatever else from this company over here, the operating company is the one that gets sued and it has nothing, okay? The holding company owns all the assets, but it didn't do anything. It just provided equipment, right? So that's one way to protect. And so typically a business owner, when they decide to buy a building, they set up a second company and the second company owns the building so that if they, the operating company gets sued into the ground, they still own a building. And they can start again. That is lawyers and accountants. <laughs> And then I deal with insuring it and protecting it all after you've figured out with them what you're doing. Okay. 
Thanks, Paul. We're running a little bit close there. Um, sure. I don't even know how long it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was fantastic. Um, are, are you going to be able to stay for the Yeah, time? I'll stick around. Fantastic. So if yeah. we do have any other questions, uh, we're going to give you guys a real quick break. Um, about 10 minutes here. Uh, so we could have a huge round of applause for Paul. Dr.